and welcome to Under the Sticks, a podcast brought to you by the United Rugby Championships. My name is Andy McGeady, and before I introduce some of the lovely people on the show today, I need to do some housekeeping because we've done a couple of things for the show. It's not weekly. We're going out monthly and it's not live. So we, if you want to get your comments into the show, please use the social channels, use uh, Under the Sticks on Twitter, use hashtag UTS Rugby, and we will be going out live on, sorry, we're not going. I'm going to have to get used to this uh, on the URC official Facebook and YouTube platforms. Um, lads, Sean Holly, how are you? Really good. Really good. Delighted to be back uh, in huge anticipation. New format, new competition. The URC, what a start it's been. Everybody's added something. And uh, can't wait to get stuck in with the boys to, to discuss all the first four rounds. Um, Kamani uh, Bobo, I have here um, South African TV's answer to Sean Holly. What I prefer to think to you is what Sean Holly could be someday. Kamani, how are you? Wow, I wish I had those looks. <laughs> oh wow! Well. Oh, uh, it's been um, it's been exciting. Uh, everyone out in South Africa is actually um, taking it a bit hard the first four rounds <laughs> okay. because it's been it's been a hard schooling. It's been school of hard knocks for the boys. Uh, no wins much, um, but uh, exciting times. So I can't wait to see all those teams coming in to South Africa and just mixing it up in altitude, playing at Loftus Emirates Airline Park, and and then going down to the beautiful Cape Town Stadium. So there's so much to look forward to. Uh, I can't wait to get involved. We'll get to thoughts of revenge soon enough. Um, <laughs> but last but not least, soon to be New York Times best-selling author, and we'll get to that. Um, Paul I'm Williams. aiming. I'm aiming for the York Times, not the New York Times. Jess, that's all I want to be. Top ten books in Northern England. I'm really good, thank you. I've really enjoyed just to echo what the fellas have said there. United Rugby Championship has been everything that I wanted it to be and more. You know, just be, I've watched Super Rugby for so long, never thought I'd ever get to see the South African provinces, mm. like face to face. Been to watch the Sharks, it's amazing, I've loved it. Feels like a genuinely new, big, bold tournament. First four weeks have been brilliant. Right, we'll get to a few things. Um, so the show, we've already said it's going to feel a bit different. It's going to be doing less highlights uh, and more big topic discussions. So that's what you'll see as uh, as this new version of Under the Six uh, takes shape. So what are we going to do today? We're going to have a look at this reaction to these first four rounds of the United Rugby Championships, where we've had a good look now at particularly um, our new additions, the four South African sides. We're going to have a reaction to those games um, and to the games that are going to go ahead now in South Africa for round six and seven, when revenge will perhaps... Uh, be in the offing and um, we'll have a chat about the panel's biggest surprises of this first month of the season and um, our fans are back which is great i was one of them at a real game it was fantastic <laughs> we'll talk about the 50 22 uh we'll talk about the scarlet start of the season um which spoiler alert uh might be ugly but just we'll wait we'll wait and see what sean holly has to say um we'll see what those south african sides will face uh down south we'll talk refereeing uh emmy barrett they on made her debut uh, in the United Rugby Championship, and we might touch on some of the refereeing interpretations as well during the show. Um, the URC's new stat, expected points for rugby, we'll dance around that for a while. Um, I'll have to do some promos and plugs because that's part of my job, um, including for Paul's new book, but we're not doing it yet. You have to wait for that. And we'll talk about our favourite tries from the first four rounds as well as some of the stuff that you sent through when we asked for it. But straight away... Reaction from rounds one to four. Paul, straight to you because you you started going there anyway. Um, what was what was the what was how did it feel the start to this season? Did it feel a little bit different to you? Yeah, it felt very different. Just looking at the table before we it even started, it looked brilliant. Just see, just seeing like you know storm, sharks, lions. It was fab. I loved it from the opening week. It's a bit tricky because the South African teams as Gabani's alluded to, struggled in the first couple of weeks. They have got some players missing. I appreciate it's not stacks and stacks because a lot of them are in Europe, but there's some key players missing from that Stormers pack, for instance, like Malherb, who's now injured, Kurtz off those guys. So there are key players missing. The first two weeks, it seemed to take them by surprise a bit. 
especially the speed of the ruck. Sean alluded to that last season. He said that they might struggle with that and defensively the speed of it. And then that shifted then in the second two weeks. So they'd obviously, you know, looked at a bit of tape on more tape than they had two weeks before, solidified it. I'm not saying, you know, they were winning four from four, but that second week, it looked like they were identifying the ways they could improve and did. wasn't quite the same in round four, but I, I've loved it all. And like you say, on social media, the first two weeks, everyone was giving it the big one. Oh, is that your best teams, is it? We'll see how you get on. You wait till you've been down there on a two-week tour and then see how you get on. And I think unless you're from Leinster or possibly Glasgow and you can run in it or maybe Carnot, see, let's see where we are Christmas time. It's going to be a very different picture. What's it been like in um, South Africa, Gabani? Because there's certainly been... Um there's been a huge amount of interest. Uh, like we felt it even towards the end of last season um, that the interest for South Africa was really sparking something a little bit different in the competition when the Rainbow Cup turned around. And now we've got South African teams in from the start. W- what does it feel like on the ground in South Africa? Well, it's been feeling a bit um, as if we, this is a rude awakening, first of all, <laughs> excuse me. Um, just uh, the intensity. I mean, the, 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 the teams have been playing amongst each other uh, for the last two years or 20 months odd. And, and and it felt a bit comfortable for the Bulls to just dominate everyone. And everyone was chasing the Bulls pack, the Bulls sort of way of going about it, uh, to to the uh, Springbok sort of game plan. So lots has been focused on how South African teams just need to be much more dynamic. We need to play a much more attractive rugby. There's so much kicking and tactical and all of that. So with all of that going around and then the results not going for the South African franchises, it's been, I could say, it's been dire in the way that the people and the public sort of reacted. And most of the blame, find funny enough, because everyone is a supporter, uh, it's been blessed actually fronted on upon the officiating. It's just been so different in the way that the players have been accustomed to the Southern Hemisphere refereeing and and the way everything has been going. So, as you know, once you start losing, you pull out the magnifying glass, you're trying to spit and and show every little ink that is being done wrong for the South African side. But it's been something that they had to adapt to. Uh, I thought that the, uh, the players and the management adapted well in the uh, second and third rounds, we yeah. started seeing some few wins. Um, for me, the biggest thing was uh, the work rate of the players, just the intensity of what was brought by, especially by those Irish sides, the way they just kept on recycling the ball and, and asking more questions than mostly South African teams having sort of asked each other. And and they were found wanting. And uh, some sometimes uh, I thought our defence was a bit soft and... Uh, Finally, the players are starting to feel that they're part of this. It's it's such a, a an exciting um, big product, and and we want to do well as a South African side as they go into it. So so much pressure on those players. Um, Paul mentioned that there's some few uh, players missing in the squads. Yeah, the Sharks probably uh, are the team that's hard hit because you think about the look on your arms. And you think about Makazole, Mapin, PC, Akolisi, all those additions that could actually sort of give a bit of more impetus and the way that the teams want to pull up. But yeah, it's been um, it's been a rude awakening, but I can't wait to see how these sides travel to, to Loftus, to, yeah. to a sticky uh, humidity and, and Durban and, and the Shark Tank. So it's going to be interesting to see how it all pans out. Yeah, it's going to be good because we it's only very, very recently that we got clearance to actually have those games yeah. happen um, in South Africa, Sean, with the South Africa being taken off the, the travel list for, for Britain. So we now don't have South African sides playing in Italy. We've got them playing um, in South Africa. But looking back to those first four weekends of games, what do you see with the coach's hat on, um, particularly from the South African sides? And we'll get to some of the other sides soon. Well, surprise, surprise, surprise. I wasn't that surprised. You know, uh, you listen to Cabani. These these guys have been pretty insular playing against each other. You know, we're not talking about average sides in, in the URC. We're talking about European contenders, particularly in the top three Irish sides that we have now. Uh, usual suspects. No surprise there. Playing at home, you know, off a run of a good long preseason. 
no surprise there. Leinster have had a couple of home games. Munster have had some players back. So that there was no surprise there for me um, in terms of the South African side going to be. Because don't forget, they travel to Italy and then they travel again you know, to Scotland and, and to Wales and to Ireland. So it's it's been like a double tour for them. But I've been so impressed with the way they've adapted. It's a bit like a, an old school talk, Barney, isn't it? There's that, mm. um, so what they what what they've had is opportunity to live and breathe it for, for three, four weeks. And in that, the coaches, then they have the boys on tap so they can give them their downtime. They can work on the, on the clips and then they can improve. They're studying, they're learning. And my goodness, haven't they learned? I've been so impressed with them the last couple of weeks. I was at the Ospreys Sharks game. Sharks, I feared for the most, if I'm honest, you know, the Lions got an early win, but you know, to see how they had adapted to go down to Swansea and they turned them over, really, really turned them over in terms of preparation tactically, um, thoroughly deserved, played all the rugby. It wasn't like a ground out win. It was a beautiful night down there. And that gave me massive hope then. And and the Bulls then resort into what we'd had expected, you know, going back to type with uh, Kutsia and Bismarck Duplessis, just bullying young Cardiff forwards. It was like... <laughs> Wow, yes, this is what we've got. You know, we can't just look at the Irish sides and go, oh, we can beat these guys. We've got games on our hands. So, you know, I realise they've got guys to come back, but they've got a break now. They go home, they've got a break, they'll be reviewing, they have freshen up, they're on home turf. They've all got a win. They've all got one win already, mm. which on the road this early in the URC, you've got to say is good. For, for Just go back to the start, and I commentated at Edinburgh Scarlets in uh, round one. I'd seen what had happened the night before. There was like a, an explosion of tries and the new competition. I was like, oh, yes. And I got it at Edinburgh. New stadium <laughs> in the yeah. shadows of, uh, of Murrayfield. Beautiful day. Crowd. Me and Jim Howard and we're in the crowd commenting. I would loved it. Uh, even six, six and a half thousand. It's ideal because they're, they're right on the pitch. Mm. Fantastic game of rugby. Two new coaches. Teams going at it. Hammer and Tong. Great tries. And it's con- it's continued. You have to say, there's been the odd, you know, there's been the odd game. But you're going to get that in so many games of rugby. And so, mm. so by and large, it's exciting. I'm really looking forward to round six. Uh, how are Munster going to perform? Because, Cabani, you, you asked that question. You get what you get from Munster and Leinster and Ulster, even when they go away, when they wear that shirt, as the Scarlets found to, the, to their peril against Munster. You know, it, it's going to be really, really good to see how our sides adapt down there. So I uh, couldn't, couldn't have wished for a better start, Andy. Yeah. And do you know, one more little thing I was just going to mention quickly is one consistent element of the South African rugby so far has been the scrummage. So even in the games where they've been poor, They've all had solid scrums. And I think as the weather gets worse up here and they come back, that will only be another advantage. You know, if you've got a massive set piece come January, February, and everyone's playing in mud, that's that's a big plus. So I think the scrummaging, and I know it's a bit, Sean always pulls me up on my stereotypes. But it is a stereotype of South African rugby. But it's one that's true. They they all, they all have solid scrums. So I think yeah, we are... You no, go, just, just, Ali, just the one thing. Yeah, set piece is... is is key for South African teams, and and it's been it's been one thing that's been lacking. I thought that the dominance from from a driving mall hasn't really come out from the South African side, and and that's something they have to work on because it's just working against world class coaching systems and players who are well attuned to what they want to do to disrupt that, and and like saying learning uh, on the hoof, and uh, hopefully we can start seeing that well-organized teams and, and, and a really, a really good front up from the franchises from South Africa. Yeah, this would be good. And it is, I'll restate, it is really important um, that we do see the other teams go down to play them in South Africa. So, oh, yeah. You know, yes, we're still in post-COVID landscape and you do what you yeah. do to keep the competition going, but it's so much better that we're not playing those games in Italy. It's just true. Yeah. Um Okay, we'll skip ahead. The panel's biggest surprises from this first month of games. Um, we were firing these out in the WhatsApp group. Uh, there, there was a couple, two of us went for the same one um, in a different way. Uh, but let's go to Sean, Holly, your biggest surprise first. Well, my biggest surprise is uh, it's, a, it's hit Southwest Wales by, uh, by slapped them in the face a little bit. It's just been the my way book. the Scarlet's. The way the Scarlets have... It's not your book, Paul, no. It's, um, 
That's a ridiculous early plug, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's a scold for him earlier. I was going to be trying to be nice this series too, but I can see I'm going to have to roll my sleeve and get my coaching no, hat that's on. That's getting a little jab. But uh, it's been the it's been the uh, the capitulation of the Scarlets, yeah. uh, renewed hope uh, and the Dwayne Peel. Yes, a young head coach, his first head coach role, but he's kept a bit of teeth, a little bit with me at Bristol, and then with Dan McFarland at Elster. Uh, the prodigal son, if you like, going home and you know starting the season with 12, 13 internationals in their team. Yeah, they 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 did okay up in Edinburgh. Lots of mistakes. I thought, oh, they'll go home. They play the Lions, caught the Lions, got a bonus point try, right, last play of the game. And you thought, well, okay, they'll steady now. They're finding their feet. Bang, Munster. You know, hmm. they prepared by all accounts. They prepared for a, a full blown Munster um, team. You can't do that. You prepare for Munster. You don't prepare for names because whoever's wearing that Munster shirt, trust me, when I saw the Munster team, I thought, master stroke by Johan van Graan. Uh, and they delivered. They were outstanding on the day. But the Scars were genuinely poor. It was like men against boys. And it was a little bit embarrassing down there because a decent crowd had turned up. So I thought, I'll see a reaction commentating on Leinster Scars the week after. Oh, my goodness. We did see a bit of reaction for 20 minutes, but... You know, I know it's Leinster, but yeah. come on, there was 12 internationals that started the game and they got bullied and outplayed and it was, it was 50 points. It should have been 50 Munster before. They've got Benetton on Friday night at home. It's a mm. massive, massive banana skin. I'm telling you, I saw Benetton against that. Ospreys. Yeah, they, yeah, they could easily lose it. <laughs> Reno Smith that. gets going. Yeah. Uh, Montiwane. <laughs> so that, easily lose that. So that that's been. I know it's a it's a little bit of a generic one, but it, it's been a surprise because the anticipation was here in Wales for Scarlets yeah. uh, to have a good season, you know, and uh, have the way the Welsh regions have performed in the last few years. But wow, you know, big surprise. All right, Gavani, your biggest your biggest surprise so far. Well, the biggest surprise, I guess, it's been the Bulls. Um, they've been dominating, winning every single cup in South Africa, and almost walking away with it. And it's not the way that they just won. They've been actually being the Bulls rugby and being so physical and and lots of discipline. And all of a sudden, they find themselves in a space where they're so desperate that they're giving away silly penalties and, and they're constantly, virtually just stepping over the line. And it's been one of those uh, disappointing things to see a side that everyone thought they will give it a good run. Um, they, they're not getting a dominance up front like they normally used to. And they couldn't string passes together. So it's been a very disappointing. But you could see the players who are used to the competition, um, the way that they've started. Arnold Porter, Masal Kutia really have shown the other players what is the standard of this competition. And, um, yeah, it's something that they really have to get up to. And it's just been one of those. Everyone is sort of looking around, thinking, "What's going on in, in Pretoria?" Um, and and Jake's white knowledge of um, Connaught was just like, mm, "My goodness, don't go there." So it's it's one of those wake up calls that everyone needs to have. And um, the South African teams really big wake up call was seeing the Bulls sort of struggle so badly. Mm. Mr. Williams. Right. My biggest surprise, <clears throat> pardon me, has been the goal line restart and the treatment of it by Chamberlain, the 10, is amazing. Because that isn't, you know, that that new law has been around for, let's say, 12 months loosely in various competitions. In different competitions. Nobody, yeah, nobody has attempted that twice. And it's changed the game now already. Last weekend, you noticed all of their outside halves were kicking to the wide channel, so they were kicking it t as tight as they could to the touchline, or pinging it deep, or don't kick it to the best drop goal kicker in the league. Well, no, don't do it twice. Oh, don't do it twice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't do it twice in a row. You know, you're dropping it to their 10. So that that's what I've loved. I love these law tweaks and how it affects the game. Um, and those two instances were just amazing. And this, and this is the second one. It was actually his third drop goal in the game. But this is the one that sealed it for me because I went for that same that same <laughs> line. Because the reaction of everybody once that happened, including the player, including the fans, and everybody watching, 
was yeah. that he has just changed the game. Yeah, I was Andy. I was there, right? I was commenting on this. I watched that Gareth Anscombe move to the 15 meter line, close to the touchline, and I watched Chamberlain mirror him. Just follow him. What he, okay, no, yeah. your space asked in the week whether this law you were allowed to drop goal. Yeah. So, and yet they still, and they they should have learned in the first half. It was a beautiful night. Yeah. And then and then you go and kick it down his throat, and that was a really important part of the game. <laughs> it was. Yeah. The game was a little bit in the balance, you know. Yeah. And it's almost like, oh, go on then, try it again. Well, you ain't gonna do it. Nobody else is gonna do it from now on, are they? To him, you want, I don't think you'll see that again. Now it'll all be either drilled into like touch lines. Oh, I don't know what else you can do. Or do you do the NFL style thing and you just send two wingers up? And they've just got to get as near as they can to a block, but it's so far. I don't know what you can do. I've, I've yet to see a team try and get the ball back yet. No, I know, yeah, exactly. Think, think of seven as Caban. You, you know, along the twenty-two, the dropout. You know, you, you try and get the ball back. Now, most of the guys at the moment are in the backfield. Yeah, I think Caban might guys. have lost um, audio. Right, yeah, well, like you, like he you will say, agree with me. You got fifteen yeah, guys on the line, right? I know it's high risk. Yeah. But is it? It's a numbers game. You have got fifteen guys on the line. Yeah. Most or half of the opposition are going to be behind the twenty-two. So you got yeah. a fifteen to eight chance of getting it back. Nobody's trying it. No. It's going to be good fun when desperation mandates that you need to try it, and, <laughs> exactly. the, app, and the opposition knows you need to try it. These yeah. are the situations you love. But yeah. I did think it was great. The, the reaction to it at the time a week ago was really interesting because you had. It's sort of people like Paul, me, um, going, this is amazing. That's the incredible. Nerds. That is brilliant. He has changed the game. The Some other people were going, oh, no, that's a horrible side effect from the new laws. That shouldn't be allowed. Yeah. If yeah. a guy wants to try a 50-yard drop goal, I'm in all day long. We want to see skillful things. That is a skillful thing. I'm, I'm there all day long for this. Yeah, and also the flip of that is the attacking team is still, still supposed to have some kind of advantage. They used yeah. to get a five-meter scrum, which is obviously a far bigger advantage. But it, it's not like a punishment where you're not allowed to score from it at all. It's it's there for you to attack with. Mate, it's, like a, it's a hell of a skill, Paul. Oh, it's a hell of, all it's not, of it. It's not like everybody in the league now. And, and when you go and watch the uh, the lower leagues in, in, in South Wales now, that every yeah. kid's going to be doing it. That <laughs> is, that, yeah. that is a, a hell of a skill. He has to oh. connect. You know, he has to have the direction and the distance. I think the biggest, well, obviously, our sides, the northern side, is going down to altitude. Now, you've got Pretoria and that. You, you ain't kicking it down there long. No chance. Yeah. So speaking of kicking, um, the fifty twenty two uh, oh, is lovely. is also here. This has definitely changed the game. Oh, we're man. seeing in various Brilliant. leagues, not just the uh, United Rugby Championships, we're seeing some really, really clever kicks. Um, we're also seeing forwards roll up. <laughs> he would, back in the day, would have done with the fifty twenty two law. He'd have loved this, pretending he's an out half. Um, Gabani, uh, what, yeah. What so far, how's it changed in the game? Well, um, I think it's brilliant because we've had this rugby league sort of defensive pattern when everyone is trying to fill up the field with about 13, 14 players, just one person uh, marshalling the back. All of a sudden now it's creating that space. And, and it's good tactically because you, you can um, get yourself in the right places. Can you imagine playing a team that is so dominant with their driving lineup malls? And you've got an accurate kicker who can put you uh, five meters away from that try line. Um, think about in the last minute of the games, all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, what a stupid idea. What are you doing? Why are you kicking the ball? You get a 50-22. You've got the ball back inside the 22. I think it just brings a lot of um, innovation in the way of thinking. Um, it's giving better um better sort of options for game management for the fly halves or the players that are there. Um, I just think that there could be a different way of, of actually getting that and making it much easier by just pulling the ball back to maybe to your 13 so he can put his little uh, roll-on ball down to the to, to the 22. So there's a whole lot of more that could happen, even with that drop line, uh, that, that, that try line drop out. I thought they had to set a face first, but I see the, the, the Sharks went and, and found out with the officials that it's actually fine to just kick a drop kick. 
Um, but for me, I'm just happy the fact that there's much more thinking. Um, as much as there is a whole lot of laws in rugby which need to be somehow simplified into one little play, like page where play where no one has to say no. This is the way that we interpret it. Yeah. It's supposed to be. This is what goes down, and this is how everyone is going to adhere to it. So the 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 the, the fifty twenty two for me, I think it's a great initiative. I think it just creates a such a a skillful way to reward um, good tactical kicking. Sure. Yeah, and Sean, one one thing just before we leave the fifty twenty two. Um, I think it was Brett Igo uh, on Twitter had a little clip, um, and if it wasn't Brett, I apologize, um, illustrating how you can, how a clever coach can actually fake a 50 to, to create space and then use it. Well, the, the, the onus is on the winger and the 13 in the defending team, particularly the winger, right? Think of a fullback, if he's back on his own, he has to cover quite a lot of space. So um, the winger has to hedge his bets. So that if a, a 50-22 is attempted, and what the point I wanted to make is from a coaching point of view, you are now going to look at having 12s who can kick, yeah. 15s mm. who can kick with different feet, because mm. if you shift the ball and the winger comes up, because he has to come into the defensive line, yeah. now that leaves the space. It's why people like myself pick the likes of James Hook at 12, because you shift the ball to 12, the winger comes up, he can kick from 12. It's a little bit of a throwback to when, you know, sides play 10 and 12. Australia used to do it a lot with the, with Ella and Line and so on. But um, <coughs> the, the reverse can happen then. You shape the kick from, say, 10. The winger drops back in anticipation early. You then shift the ball uh, because there's space on the edge. Uh, so that that's what it brings for me. And... It's a little bit of old school back, but the it's not old school. It's new school because you get the line out. And how good is that? Because mm -hmm. if you have yeah, that weapon, then you're going to try it. I think early on, sides were trying. There wasn't a lot of 50-22s because they were either mm -hmm. trying it and the winger was back or mm -hmm. they didn't quite work out how to find that space. They are working that out now. And I think what's beautiful is that horrible dead zone in the middle of the pitch where everyone used to be terrified of either having the ball or conceding the ball mm. or just just doing anything. Now, at least on a bit of that section, you can attack, can't you? Mm. You know, it can give you an attacking kick in the corner, like, like Sean's saying. So it's nice that that once dead zone in the middle is now alive. It is. Um, it's good that you took the last comment there because before we go into the next segment, um, there's a book coming out written by one oh. of our party. Um, soon. I, I, can I advertise something next month? He was, nearly out, sick on his own leg. <laughs> he was nearly sick on his golf jumper. You slip me a fiver, I'll talk about whatever you want, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's by Paul Williams. It's called uh, Rugby Has Fucking Laws, Not Rules. An irreverent yeah. look at the laws. It has been called surprisingly insightful. Did you write that yourself? No, that's actually from the publishers, which is sort of a little bit of a dig. Because they're surprised by how insightful it was, even though they've published it. Yeah, no, it's good. And thank you very much for mentioning it. I would never have done that. You know me and plugs. I'm not into that sort of thing. No, you um, never do. But yeah, so it'll be out now in November the 4th. And thank you very much. You're also the man who previously in this parish slated the whole art of reading. It did say the books were outdated, yeah. I've, I've, uh, people are allowed to change their mind, is what I would say. <laughs> well, um, they said something, yeah. And in the summer, <laughs> in the summer, I accidentally wrote a book and thought, you know what, I'm down with this medieval practice again of writing things down on paper. And there, yeah, it's out. It'll be out now in two weeks. What is it? Congrats, Paul. I've gone through the whole of the rugby law book and written what I think at the end of those sentences, basically. Oh, my God. I'm kind of save myself like 24 hours. Oh my you? goodness! I'll send you a piece. Did... I don't reckon you'll get past page three. Sean, you'll come up to my house and set fire to me. We're doing an unboxing and reaction video. Two <laughs> calls, right? <laughs> Quietly. Um, oh man! Speaking of laws and the application of same, uh, we had a debut um, in the Benetton Ospreys match of a new referee in the competition, uh, Emmy Barth Theron, uh, South African, former sevens and fifteens player, uh, Gabani. Um, I straight up, I don't know her experience in the game in South Africa, but her first, her first job up here. 
Yeah, I know. She's been brilliant. Uh, she's been in um, and the development group of uh, officials doing a whole lot in um, and super rightly uh, as a AR and um, she she took over um, refereeing the whistle and the carry cup. Uh, she's broken a few um, records in the way that she went on to ref the first game of the Women's World Cup, um, which was held up in Ireland. And uh, she's been really at it, a uh, former outside back. That's why she's a referee. She can literally think and uh, and, and do all the most, uh, which other forwards can't do. Um, no, she's, 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 she's good at her work. Uh, what I like about her is a communication. Uh, she comes very really across uh, steady uh, and uh, precise in, in the way that she goes about her work. Um, and, and she's one of those uh, ladies who never sort of, uh, she, she always keeps it cool and she's always got a chirp or two too. I thought she did well, Land. I thought, yeah, I, I yeah. thought she did. She's got a good way about her. Uh, mm. Very relaxed. I thought, I thought she spoke clearly. She didn't rush decisions or or panic um yeah you know uh, and that's what we want to me something seamless yeah, from our yeah. officials male or female um so a brilliant addition for for the urc uh great for for ex women players who want to go into referee and shows it can be a joy neville as a trailblazer obviously um however there was an incident at the end of her game that i think she may look back on and go, do you know, it was a tough one. It was the end of the Ospreys Benetton game. And um, there was an unfortunate incident in the air. I think it was, um, mm. oh, the, the eight Morgan Morris, right on as a replacement, went up for the high ball. There was a chasing winger who got pushed by Tom Botha. And mm. she, she spent a lot of time. I'm not so sure the TMO helped a lot or the AR. They yeah, are just standing around nodding now. They're like nodding dogs. <laughs> but um, but she recognised there was a push, which was the right thing. But she still gave the penalty to the Ospreys. Right. Now it was twenty nine yeah. twenty six with a minute to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw another a similar incident in a different competition on the weekend where the penalty was given for the push. Oh, that, incident, that incident may not have happened had the player not been pushed. Yeah. So if some butts, but if I, I was, I always sometimes look at these things as a coach and go, oh, cry, I wouldn't have been happy if I was Paul Gustard, you know, or, so, that, but that isn't anything to do with her personally, oh, you know, that is a decision perhaps to look at. It's a difficult one. Can I, can I pick tricky. you up on one thing there though, because you were saying if you were a coach, well, it has been a theme we've had, uh, I know, Jay Quise, there's a couple of the South African coaches and I suppose the we'll call people around the game from the South African point of view have been a little unhappy with interpretations. Yeah. Um, this last weekend, certainly uh, Andy Friend was less than happy with some of the uh, decision making in the uh, Monster Connacht game. Um, there is a there is a bit of a theme going on. It's been pointed out that there's no uh, that Greg Garner's left as the referee's chief for the uh, United Rugby Championship or my um, information is that there is a, an interview process coming to a conclusion and there will be a new referees manager coming soon. They're going through right. the process. But it's a bit of a team and it's unfortunate that it is um, coming through in some of the, the media accounts. Um, Paul, like, what's your, you always have a good kind of feel for some of this. What do you think? Well, what I always feel is that rugby is impossible to referee perfectly. It can't ever be done, right? There's not never been a game that's refereed perfectly, and there never will be. It can't be done. And for everyone that goes wrong, one will have gone your way. And I, I, you know, having a chief head of referees that is required because you need one person who's in charge who can get everyone together and say, right, from now on, we're not doing this or, or whatever we're going to do. But it's never going to be perfect. There are so many things going on in rugby. They're in a constant state of flux. You know, that offside against Munster on the weekend, that should have been picked up probably because, there are, you know, you've got an AR there. That should be their role there. But if you look at the ruck, I mean, it's like nuclear fission, the amount of things that are going on. There are, like, there are at least four or five people moving. Most are off their feet. 
that's without even looking at the hands in the ruck. You can't do it all. And I know that isn't the answer people want to hear because they want it to be like tennis or cricket where everything's really objective and there's a black and a white and there's a stump cam. But rugby isn't like that and it no. never will be. You're right, yeah, man. Exactly. Let's let's be clear. You know, this isn't a URC issue. This, Everywhere. This this happened. It's happened to me mm. in 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 England, right? It's happened to me in international level, uh, and in uh, this competition when I was coaching whatever guys it was. So it's not that, and it is extremely difficult live to pick oh. up everything. All right. What's always been a, a little bone of contention of mine is. When it does get cl quite clinical, Paul, and black and white, there, there's a lack of empathy sometimes from officials, yeah. mm -hmm. particularly young officials who may not have played the game or may not have coached the game, yeah. which there are a lot. The consequences of some decisions and the ramifications are massive. Yeah. You know, one ref, we should remain nameless. One night when we're on the whiskey doing this, I will name him, but co <laughs> cost, cost my team promotion to the English Premiership and recognised right. mm -hmm. the, the, how bad a decision it was. Mm -hmm. That one on the weekend, it could have gone either way, but it, yeah. if you're, if you're, I see the Benetton captain was incensed, you know. Mm -hmm. There was one I did, um, Munster Scarlets. Now, as Paulie Scarlets were played in the first half, there was, um, an instant right in the last minute of the first half where the winger went for the ball palms up uh, to intercept it was yeah. not a deliberate knockdown no, the no. ar comes in says it's a deliberate knockdown i'm thinking yeah. as a coach clock months they're going to score you mm -hmm. they kick for the corner went bang 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 scored took the game away at half time scarlet's all of a sudden are running into half time changed the game right change the mindset so it's the ramifications for me and and we do need somebody in that position head of referees to help yeah, monitor yeah. and nurture but it's in, it's imperative that urc make the right decision get the right person that could take a lot of time or uh, however time is required it's not about getting one next week because there's been a couple of incidents it, it has to be the right person and however long that takes it'll take can i go just, just one power? sorry just, Andy. you go Sorry, and can I can I can I jump in here? Um, because I was just checking out the the Stormers games, all four games, and and the first three games, throughout the whole penalties given, there was about twenty three penalties in the first three games that they played, and then and and the last game against the Dragons. Funny enough, they only gave away four penalties in the really? whole game. Wow. Four penalties in the whole game, but on the other side, um, the the, the dragons gave away a good a good 12. so you think to yourself i mean what's that i mean where do we sort of measure and and say how do, is the other side getting better or they they just playing in the right side of the field or, or something like that and and it, and it comes down to even the the tackle that solomon murat put out i thought it was just a brute tackle that whiplash yeah. the man's head and that's why his chin touched his shoulder I mean, that should, for me, should have been carry on. What a hit. We want to see more of that. And all of a sudden now players are thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't be going as sort of front on and full on in my defense. So, yeah, laws is important. And, and we need to officiate that better because it does sometimes spoil the spectacle. I will say there's, there's a couple of things that, that have picked up so far this season. Um, I've been really impressed with some of the communication from AJ Jacobs. I think some of his work with the TMO in terms of explaining to everybody, including viewers, here's what's going on. Here's what I'm seeing. You know, uh, Luke Pierce in England is very good at that as well. He's like class. It. Yeah. Um, there's. He's Welsh. I don't. I don't like the new trend for these um, what I call propaganda videos, picking apart a referee and performance you don't like. Because Paul's right on every single, like especially when it comes to the breakdown. Oh. If you want to find an offence, it's like American football. You can yeah. find an offence. Okay. Hundreds of them. You just need to have a bit more empathy for the game as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's not even just one game, you know, the season as a whole. These, these things come around, but at the same time, yeah, there's some decisions that shouldn't be made. We saw a couple of the weekend. Hopefully, these things will smooth out. I think that's the most balanced debate we've ever had. Yeah, I guess it was I'm all that. four people <laughs> with a different opinion, but <laughs> no. I like that. Next up, um, <laughs> There's been an addition uh, this year. In fact, before I get to this, um, you asked for fantasy to return. Fantasy has been going in and out mm. of the competition um, for a couple of years. Uh, you yeah. asked for it to return. The URC listened 
uh, they've teamed up with Superbrew to bring you the official URC fantasy game. And okay. um, you can join at any point in the season to play with your friends or enemies. Um, it's free, quick, simple to play. You can week you can win weekly, monthly, and yearly prizes. Play against thousands of fans from across the world. Play on desktop, laptop, tablet, or mobile, and set up your own private mini leagues. Visit www.superbrew.com forward slash tournaments forward slash rugby dash union forward slash U or C to join. We, we, um, we have to have an end of the <laughs> we, we have no. to have an end of sticks competition, I, don't we? See, I disagree. Because if we have one of those, you'll be bullying me every day then. Because you'll be looking going, oh. We have to that. enter a team. We have to enter a team. We have to. Uh, I tell you what, I took on the, um, the new URC algorithm the other week. I was asked. Yeah. Um, by our esteemed producer to uh, yeah, you do your predictions and, and scores, you know. And uh, mm. I would have beaten the algorithm. Actually, we we drew in terms of results. We got one wrong, and it was that Benetton last <laughs> oh, ditch really? drop goal. Yeah, <laughs> oh. but on the, I think on the score difference, I I beat it until that point. Um, it took me away, but uh, that was that was interesting to do. Uh, the going. algorithm, how it works out, because mm. I wasn't allowed to see the algorithm scores. I put my scores, and we were we were pretty close, you know. So uh, it's amazing how they how they work those things out. So I watch think I fare so well doing that. Watch this. Um, think you can predict all of the winners in each round of the URC? Then sign up and challenge your friends by playing the URC predictor game by there visiting is. www.superbrew.com forward slash URC underscore predictor. There we go. I'm getting through my reads. So I'm going to get paid. Do it um, really well. <laughs> you get paid. We, have new staff. <laughs> no. we get paid. That's new. Um, <laughs> I'm in trouble. Um, we have a new stat. Uh, expected points for rugby. Um, mm. Charlie Morgan did a piece on this in the Telegraph. Um, mm. I was interested because it's uh, in a previous life, I wrote quite a lot about stats in various sports. Um, and expected points, uh, it's, it's interesting. So... This has come around from uh, Adam. You probably got a graphic there somewhere, do you? If you want to throw it up, you could. But um, expected points is the Boffins, the stat master in URC, has tried to apply um, a methodology for working out what all the little things contribute to in a game. So not just I got the kicks, Sean got the try, Gabani got a drop goal, Paul showed up, right? There's, Paul put in the big tackle, match winning tackle. That's what, we um, that's what I meant. On the line, try really line, mean. chest it's line. all the other things in the game. Wow. So line breaks, defenders beaten, um, a pass, error. Error is also being very important in the game. They've tried to analyze lots of rugby data through the seasons to work out, well, how much of a point are all these things worth? Mm. So, for example, uh, a line out. So your expected points added by a defending steal would be Half a point. Right. Taken in isolation. An attacking catch, not a steal, it's point one of a point. And all these things would add up towards something that looked like a realistic score in a game. So it'll be interesting to see how this thing uh, works out through the season. Um, I know Charlie in Charlie Morgan's piece, um, he was, you get a good quote here from uh, Gordon Hamilton Fairley, because he co-founded Oval Insights, who did some of the work on this. And he said, when people have tried to make rugby more sophisticated, they've generally done so by counting more events or combining them into new metrics rather than actually trying to model their impact on the points in a game. Right. So, can I, uh, Sean, can I uh, tell you something yeah, about this? Yeah. Little, little story. Yeah. Um, we, uh, as coaches, you, you, you code the game, right? Some coaches are lazy, they get the, their analysts to do it. Yeah. Uh, uh, we we got our coaches to to code the games. Why they go through it with a fine tooth comb, and you we got to the point where you created your own code template. So cut long story short, let's take tackling. Right, uh, one set of codes would be for mm. a type of tackle. All right, um, so underneath our buttons built in by the digital guys would be uh, ratings. You know, scoring and rating. So, for example, a tackle could have either been, and I'm using broad sense here, an effective tackle, mm -hmm. a neutral neutral tackle, mm -hmm. a passive tackle, or 
a missed mm -hmm. tackle, right? So under those buttons, if I if I press Kobani effective tackle, Kobani effective tackle, he, he's he's amassing positive points. If I'm coding mm -hmm. Paul and he's got passive tackle, neutral Sorry. tackle, missed tackle, he could end up with really low or negative points. So that would produce then mm -hmm. the software would produce a, a chart of who the most effective tackler was in the game for our team. Right. That's so, done live. Mm. Do you mind me asking? Is that done live? That's done live. Not, not that, no, not by the coaches because they're watching the game and they, the analysts right. would code it live, live because yes. we're trying to train mm. the analysts to have coaches' minds. Got you. Because as, 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 as much as the analysts think they know the game, mm. they, they would be coaches if they knew as much, wouldn't they? So, yeah. um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, know, you know, so uh, we, we pretty much trained all our coaches to be like that. And it was interesting because you came up with, you know, cl clearly a league table in different areas. That could be ball carries. It could be kicks. Yeah. It mm. could be line up work. You know, it was all sorts of things. A lot of work, a lot of work, yeah. but players liked it because there was like a league table and you showed up who you who your best tackler was and so on. But this is the stat master methodology. And it's along similar lines about trying to get some sort of uh, status, if you like, um, positive mm -hmm. and negative points for, for good and, um, and bad things in the game. So, the red card there is what, minus three? Minus 3.8. I was going to pick up something similar. Ye yellow card here is minus one, right? Why yeah. is that interesting? Because you still got the old trope of yellow card being, ah, oh, while that man's in the bin, it's going to be seven points down. Yeah. Actually, about two points on average. Yeah. You know, which isn't so that much. Well, I, I know it is when they all stack up. Because now you get teams getting two or three yellow cards quite regularly. That didn't happen when you used to watch rugby mm. in the nineties. Whereas now no. you'll you'll see with two at one point quite regularly now, down to thirteen. They still cope, don't they? Yeah, mm. they do. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this develops because uh, when you look at other expected points, like expected um, goals, xG in in football. We look at things like uh, expected uh, points added in American football. There's a, another nuance to this, which is a situational um, dependence or like a, a, a context. So where you are in the field. Mm -hmm. or, you know, so if you're in American football, let's say you want to get four yards. Well, if you get four yards, that's great. If you get four yards and you need three yards for a first down, that's fantastic. If you get four yeah, yards, sad. you needed seven. Yeah, that's not so good. So it's this little bit of context. I'm excited to see where this goes because there's been really good work looking in kicking. You know, we know now what the average and the, the odds of someone making a kick from a particular part of the field is. We know that now because people have done work analyzing thousands and thousands and thousands of kicks. Let's see if we can do this with um, with, with with player in the field as well. Nice. It's, it's nerdy. It's going to really piss off some people. but It's I pretty like cool, it. though. I bet the Buckies would love it if that can get nailed down. Or they need. <laughs> <laughs> or they need. Yeah. They do it anyway, man. They got algorithms. Yeah, I was thinking they must know. They, they got algorithms. You know, <laughs> you know if you look at, if you want to put a bet on the uh, somebody to score a try in eighty minutes, mm -hmm. then you are going to be eighty to one. Kabani's going to be four to five favorite. You know, so yeah. uh, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> I reckon I'd be about twenty five to one. I'm a lot thinner these days. A lot faster. Eighty to one, man. What what about what about the points? Let's say it's a line out five meters out, team is attacking, and you make a steal. That should yeah, be it should be worth more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that should be points. That's what I'm getting now. The, the yeah, context of is. things are really really interesting, and it's actually point, especially in the football world. Like I've gone to some of these conferences, and what they go through in looking at how to value different actions in a game. Like it's almost a point of you know philosophy. Is this act in the 89th minute of a football match more valuable than one in the first minute because of that kind of context? Mm. You could be sitting there um, with your pocket protector on and your specs having a very long nerdy conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think uh -oh. another one sh should be for not taking your kickoffs. Now kickoffs, receipts, yeah, like, restart. That is huge, and most teams always mess that one up because they yeah. score and then they go and they relax, and and yeah. most teams go back into the game and then you got possession inside the opposition's half. Yeah, yeah. Or I'll tell you what we need on there is Harley's post post hit kicks. That needs to be on there. In. Minus one. Goal line restarting to the league's best drop goal expert. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> 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 Minus five for the first one, <laughs> minus ten for the second one. Yeah, and and a, a short, sharp beating if you do it three times. Yeah, you game. do that again, and I'm going to cut you. 
I think we're going to move on to something which is a little more fun. Um, we, uh, we're going to do um, kind of a little break and then we're going to do tries. Um, and for anyone who's listening on audio, okay, so we're going to look at some tries now, some of our favorite from the first couple of weeks. Um, so if you're listening on audio, this is where you can go to actually watch the, uh, the show on Facebook, Facebook or YouTube, or you can sign up to your CTV for free to watch extended highlights for free. Um, and international viewers and those in the Republic of Ireland can buy weekend and season passes to watch URC games or on demand. Visit urc.tv to sign up today. Um, uh, I paid for it because I had to, and it works. There you go. I'm, I can test me. I've used all the highlights and watching the games back, which I find very handy because I can looking for a refund there. That's why he said that he wants that back. <laughs> no, not stupid. I pay Text my own way. <laughs> I, pay, I pay my own way because then I can slag it off if it goes wrong. <laughs> Um, we did. We asked. Um, we we went outside the show and we asked uh, ourselves what we thought were our favourite tries from the first the first few weeks. Paul Williams, what try really got you excited? I went for Mark Hansen from Connacht because it looked like something from the nineteen seventies. You don't see players beating players like that anymore. Have we got a clip here? Yeah. So yeah, defensive is, space in now. I mean, obstruction. Where, but where do you get to see somebody just skinning players like that in open field? You know, he beat two players twice there. I think he beat one player nearly three times. So that was my favourite <laughs> one. And I've got a real soft spot for Connor, just the way they play, and you know, they're a lovely balanced attack. But look at this. You see that in real time. One, two. So that's three beaten. This lad hasn't got a chance. Four. Does it one? And there's the other guy again. I think it's seven. To, I think it's six or seven in one go. So that was mine. I love stuff like that. It's uh, that was is my it, try of the, of the opening month. Beautiful. Is that a is that a triple miss tackle? It's a triple one, miss uh, tackle. Yeah, minus twelve. It's a minus fifteen in Sean's algorithm. You don't play again for the rest of the year if you do that. You're it's out. A great finish. It's a great, great. finish. And there was a, there was a bit of a, a block uh, to allow him yeah, to get. Yeah, but he's take yeah. he's taking the air to start it, giving them momentum. It's a great finish. He's a bit of a <laughs> kill hero already. I he is. Point of information, I'll have you know that the officials, including the TMO, looked at that and they deemed it not a block completely yeah, well, Cabani and well, I agree. Well, <laughs> there, there is none of that in the law book, right? <laughs> if someone pushes you off your place, it's a penalty against it. That is it. And that I just didn't like the audacity and, and just the tone, the tonality of the, of the referee saying, did he really deliberately do it? It's a game. It's competitive. You will deliberately push another player off so that his player can run through. Come on. What kind of question was that? I'm going to tell you what. You anyway. won't change my mind. That was still my favourite try, no matter what you do. So <laughs> uh, I think, Sean, you're next up. Well, so many to choose from. It's very difficult. Yeah. And I, I would normally, if you ask me this, I go for a bit of a team try, don't I? Or, a, or some sort of tactical try. I've gone purely individual because... I've watched every game so far, and um, I really enjoyed last weekend watching Benetton play. Osprey's got the win, but the way Benetton played when Reno Smith came on, and I've missed oh. him. He came on at 10, right? I, oh. I, I thought the commentator got the name wrong. He had this, his, his uh, headgear on. One. I thought, no, it can't be. Then when I saw him starting to run, I was like, oh, yeah. Now, he created another try that somebody else has picked, but my one was a purely individual try. And I just love to see the audacity and the skill. Yeah, you know, Max try was fantastic, but this bit of skill, because you look at Alex Cuthbert, who's no slouch, a British and Irish lion winger coming across, right? He has to get this, this kick spot on. Not only that, he has to sidestep on the inside here, get the bounce, beat Alex Cuthbert to it, and, and get over. It's a brilliant bit of opportunist play. It shows guile. It shows a lot of balls, right? Mm -hmm. And it shows a lot of skill. Look at Cuthbert coming across there. He's probably thinking Cuthbert's twice the size of me. I really have to get my skates on to get it. But, <laughs> you know, I'm going but, off. But it was brilliant, and it was timely in the game. They were behind, and he made a massive impact. I'm really looking forward to commentating on him on Friday night. Mm. Um, 7.35, Parker Scarlett, Scarlett Kings-Benetton, Sean Holly with Eddie Butler. 
Nice. And Monty, I oh, play in the rugby. Lovely lovely plug. Yeah, lovely I thought he didn't plug. like plugs. I thought he didn't like plugs. <laughs> lovely plug. <laughs> you started it. <laughs> you started it. <laughs> So I think, uh, Gabani, you've been teed up nicely because uh, Smith did some magic things for another try in the same game. He's just been one of those players in South Africa who's been always exciting since as a youngster playing even in like unfamiliar sort of, not the big sort of franchises, but it's just the skill set of the young man. And yes, he does have a discipline. He black. just loves beating men uh, inside, outside. I mean, this is a counter the, the fact that he just decided it's time to go and 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 offload in between two players, just promoting the ball. And for me, Monty Iwani, come no. on. You don't Brilliant. do that to a person on Dirty. live television shown Dirty. across the world. I mean, this was outstanding. He said, show me your number. I mean, look at this. <laughs> the, the, the time he gets the ball and he goes inside, oh, outside, oh. it's good to see you. He probably <laughs> done his knee. Yeah, the no, defender no. did his knee there, and it was just superb. And this, a, this is what snapper. URC is all about for me. It's yeah. about knowing these new heroes and finding out more about these players. I mean, we've seen Monty doing it in Bennett, put Benetton in the final against the Bulls. But now getting to see him every weekend and everyone really having a go. And it's new heroes, and I'm, I'm looking forward to more of those. New heroes, I like that. I'm gonna nick that for my column. New <laughs> heroes. That's a Good. double plug. A double plug. Double plug. Thinking, just step in, Sean. Um, <laughs> we did. We did ask some. We did ask for some fans' favorite tries as well. I think Adam has put something together. Um, but I really enjoyed Benetton um, when they started attacking like this. Yeah, here we go. We've got a few a few tries here, Sean. We're gonna. <laughs> well, well, like, Manchester were insatiable that day. They were. I spoke to Graham Round True before. They they had come with an, an attitude to win with this team. And the thing about Munster is, you've got kids in there who just are carbon copies of their heroes, the guys, their role mm. models. But we're starting to see in the URC a couple of forward kicks. You know, this is Jack O'Donoghue, the captain, busting through. And look at that. He kicks it into the space. He's had a call from, from Liam Coombs, who was brilliant that day in our winger, sevens player, uh, playing at 13. So, and this is Jordan Williams. Uh, sorry to cut the cross, but I've coached this guy and he's got massive X factor, right? Jonah Holmes was impressive in this game, but Jordan Williams is creating stuff out of nothing. This is this is like a Monte Ioane, a Reno Smith thing. He just chips it over, gets it, and he makes it look so easy, oh. Cavani. Oh, that is so beautiful, man. It's just the time he has. It just looks like he has so much time. I mean, to, to execute that skill on the run is another thing. But oh, Cardiff, too, have been nice one try. of those teams. It's, 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 it's a difficult one to finish. I, I really don't like those when, when you're already over the trial and then someone takes your head off. I mean, this should be a oh. proper yellow card, even red, because that was reckless. Uh, and... Um, I've enjoyed seeing how teams are sort of using strike plays of lineouts yeah. and set pieces. Oh. And this is an, another way of showing how to unlock teams, especially with the rock defense on the, around the corners and the edges there. Bringing have you in, guys, he is electric. Yeah. Have you guys ever seen a team switch playing styles as quickly as Edinburgh? Well, I, I, again, I was commentating on that game and... Both of those sides now have head coaches of scrum halves, right? right. That wow. play that play involves the scrum half twice, right? In an intricate play. Yeah. Uh, from the line out setup and then here. So it's what we call a, an eleven play, one one way, one the other. Uh, he's yeah. come up, he scooted across to draw the defender out, and Darcy Graham comes back on the angle. There's no surprise to me. Mike Blair and Dwayne Peel have, have scrum halves by their nature love first phase plays because they're involved yeah. off scrum, they're involved off line out. So we can expect <laughs> to see we can expect to see a lot of that from from Edinburgh and the Scarlets this year, I think. Really shows though. The change in style at Edinburgh is incredible. Just in that first game, it's like you, you don't tend to see big coaching changes in like well in three months. But with them, it's so um, it's so overt. Same with Glasgow in some ways this season. They, they need a, like a different. They team. need a team quickly because the Akufanovat looked he cried off with an injury. 
Yeah, and he looked good in the first game against the Stormers. And I've been really impressed with Topolotto there, the new signing at Glasgow. He's been good. Have you seen any I of mean, him? This Dab- Dab- he's Dab- a yeah. was amazing. Yeah, he's class. Lotto, yeah, he, he's an offload king because he's strong. Yeah. Look at the, look at the physique on him. You, you know, I think oh. uh, there's one offload. I think Danny's trying to encourage uh, uh, a bit more of an offloading game from his team. We saw from Glasgow under Gregor a few years ago, but you know this guy mm-hmm. can can instigate that and um, you know also involved in that um, movement. Uh, my man, number seven, Rory Darge, is it? And this was quite ambitious on Scarlet. Yeah. Uh, I love the fact that the quick tap and just picking a team that is basically just walking it over for the trialer. I think for the team trial, this was probably the best try that yeah. was just a mindset, just to have a goal from within your own 22 and just keeping that ball alive. And like I like to say, it's spreading that ball around like a rumor. Yeah. I thought they were going to kick on. See, I thought you know Scott Scott Williams there has been excellent for them. He took a bump over the Isla uh, in the Munster game early, but he's been brilliant for them. But you know, again, I saw this and I thought, look at their smiles on their faces. But the Munster game and then the Leinster just whew, dented their confidence. Yeah, that was the uh, producer's pick try. Oh really? Oh, yeah. that's no good. I like that. Oh. Oh, oh, this is this is the producer. Oh, oh, this is, oh, yes. oh, the Stormers props handling. Beautiful. I mean, the the two players here who have really have changed the sort of approach for the Stormers, Mani Lipok and uh, Warwick Elant. They yeah. both played uh, 10, 12, and they they played the junior levels together. It's just the understanding. They almost could telepathy is what you could call it. To just read and run off each other beautifully. And and they're sharing that ball handling of the Stormers and playmaking. And for the first time, Stormers are looking like they might have found a fly half who can tear and ask more questions, just not just kicking. Yeah. Do you think Gallant will have a look at the box next year? Because I know yeah, everyone... He was, everyone... Yeah, Sorry. he was in the squad for the World Cup. Um, yeah. uh, and then he got injured just before that, which... Uh, open the place up for Damon Willemsen. So yeah. Wachelant is one of those players who's been earmarked a long time ago because he can play uh, at 10, he can play at 10, he can play at 12, he can play at fullback, he can play on the wing, and he's ambidextrous, he can kick with either foot. Really? So the skill set is just there. It's just the injuries have been holding him back. Yeah. Um, something to look forward to seeing how he progresses in this. Yeah. He's only 26. Like the championship. Yeah, no, it's it's been sad for him because he had long term injuries, uh, knee injuries, uh, back or back on each other, and um, and he's finally getting a bit of a run. He left the Bulls because for him they're not playing the sort of type of rugby that he likes and enjoys. As uh, at the Storm is where I think they've given him freedom to run. Thank you to um, loads of people who sent stuff in. Um, Mike Hennessy, Morgan Downey, Noel Lyons, Yeston Reese thomas Jared Fitzpatrick, Chris Roderick, and uh, Stephen Mahaffey. And I'm going to mention one thing he did say, which is one of his highlights was uh, Bismarck Duplessis being an absolute beast around the field on Saturday, then being totally charming with the fans afterwards, giving a bit of chat and looking like he was loving life on the road. Uh, that's what we want to hear. Um, that's a wrap. Uh, thank you, Kabani Bobo. Thank you, Paul Williams. Thank you, Sean Holly. Thank you, Adam Redmond and Chris Blake behind the scenes. Thanks to all of you who sent us messages about our return. Um, that was Under the Sticks, the new and different and improved Under the Sticks brought to you by the United Rugby Championship. My name's Andy McGeady. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.